And uh, I'm joined by Sam Oliver, Senior Product Specialist at CyberSafe. So thank you for joining us. Today, we're going to share insights into our, our approach to reducing cybersecurity risk in business through cyber awareness and why Viadex and CyberSafe work together. So I'm going to give you a short introduction to Viadex and our perspective on cybersecurity before handing over to Sam, who will explain in greater depth the value of addressing risk through human behavior and culture. So Videx specialize in supporting organizations to grow globally at speed safely. Uh, to do so involves cybersecurity solutions. We've always worked with our clients to implement cybersecurity solutions. Classically, cybersecurity means firewall, antivirus, endpoint management, uh, DDoS mitigation, you know, tools to lock things down and stop people doing things that they shouldn't, either as external attackers or as internal threats. But as many of us know, the threat landscape is far greater than just these risks. And now, as the infrastructure estate grows, that includes multiple platforms, locations around the world, you know, across on-prem, cloud, SaaS applications, and devices everywhere. So with that in mind, reducing risk through tools becomes a far greater challenge. Plus, our people still need the capability to do their job, and you have to find the balance between mitigating risk and shutting your users down. So all of our clients have invested significantly in cybersecurity tools and they protect them against various threats, but that is not what they're really trying to achieve. So that's why our approach to cybersecurity is what we call safer business, because that is the point, to do business, to enable your people and to grow. Um, within Viadex, that's driven through different channels. So from our CEO, Dino, who stakes our reputation on ensuring we do the right thing in every part of the business, through our ISO 27001 accreditation, to ensure we have the right policies and procedures, to our internal cyber safety program, which means every employee undertakes cyber awareness training to know how to make the right choices and identify risks to our business, our partners and our clients. So reducing risk is a combination of culture and tools to control. I was recently talking to the CISO of an organization with 600 users globally and he'd fostered a brilliant cultural approach to cyber safety. Uh, so they'd implemented cyber awareness program including face-to-face -face classroom based training and they had a separate tool to simulate phishing attacks in the event that a user clicked on three phishing emails they would have further face-to-face -face training uh, a pretty robust approach to ensure everyone is enabled with the knowledge and understands why that is part of their culture the challenge is he does all that himself so the CISO responsible for onboarding and then continuous improvement across the 600 user organization. I argue that he needs more support to streamline that process and automate the learning path to marry with the cultural approach, which he owns and is absolutely necessary. And when you're global, sometimes for speed, and we've seen this in organizations we've worked with, that normal policy and procedure can be circumnavigated because otherwise any progress is just too slow. Uh, it's not uncommon for key personnel in satellite regions to be hired remotely or with a slightly less thorough approach to an HQ hire. And those people will now be responsible for other hires and for onboarding suppliers and uh, perhaps customers too. So how do you ensure a safer business culture throughout your organization, through all your people at all times to make the right decisions, to spot situations of risk and protect your reputation? So safer business is the culture led throughout the business with the capability to implement quickly with insights to keep improving, assessing the knowledge across the organization and refreshing and updating. So lastly, from me, when I look at this from the perspective of the IT departments I work with, they run 
complex cybersecurity deployment projects for ever greater control across infrastructure and user estates. Um, there is innovation from vendors and a reason to replace or add tools and controls all the time. And each requires investment, time to deploy, risk in achieving the desired outcome, and time to upskill to manage that. So the biggest risk, according to every cybersecurity company you ever talk to, is the people. You go through all that only for it to be undermined by poor behavior. Every IT team I work with wants big, quick, visible wins. So Videx work with CyberSafe because improving cyber awareness is the biggest, quickest, most visible win. Reducing risk in the people across your business will have the greatest impact on being a safer business. So with that, I'll pass over to Sam to tell you more about how we achieve that with CyberSafe. Thanks, Sam. Thank you very much, Chris. Thank you. And uh, yeah, good afternoon, everyone. Um, thank you all for joining. Uh, really um, a pleasure to speak with you all this afternoon. Um, Chris, as, he, as is rightly pointed out, um, is, is right in highlighting the importance of the, the human aspect of cybersecurity. And it's actually one of the biggest challenges uh, that most organizations still continue to face. Um, so uh, as, as sort of a headline to help you understand who CybeSafe are as an organization, we are uh, a cybersecurity and data analytics uh, company. Um, we provide a software platform uh, which is laser focused on addressing those particular challenges um, that Chris has referred to and more um, as it relates to security awareness, but also security behavior um, and indeed security culture. Um, so when we talk about people power, uh, really what we're talking about is actually building a people centric approach to security and data protection within your organization. Because as Chris rightly points out, um, the objective is not just to be secure for security's sake, but to continue to do business securely, to be trustworthy to your clients, to your partners and to the rest of your supply chain. Um, so my name is uh, Sam Oliver. Um, I uh, am a senior product specialist, but uh, actually very recently um, moved into uh, being our, our full-time product marketing manager uh, here at CybeSafe. I've been with the team for just under three years now, um, which I think makes me something of a lifer. Um, but ultimately, uh, I really wanted to, to take part in today to, to help um, kind of extol some of the virtues of what plenty of our customers and, and indeed our, our um, partners like Viadex are experiencing those uh, sort of quick and, and visible wins um, for their customers. So um, I, I guess I'd just like to start with that it is something of an unfortunate fact, which is evident to those of you who already work in information security, but even to those of you who don't, um, that security awareness training uh, in isolation and in its current form um, simply isn't doing the job. Um, and it's not working because it basically makes little or no effort, generally speaking, to to influence or change behavior when it comes to security. Um, so we essentially take this approach that in order to reduce human cyber risk, that training needs to go far beyond just raising awareness of what the risks are um, and should instead focus on, on that influencing and changing of behavior, but also to build that culture of security simultaneously. Now you'll hear me, uh, not just today, but generally um, from, from CyberSafe and Videx perspective as well, refer to that collectively as the ABC approach of awareness, behavior and culture. And basically in, in today's session, um, I'll be highlighting why that is such an approach that needs to be taken um, and what influence that can actually have on your cyber resilience um, as an organization, because critically that's kind of the objective of of pretty much everything you'll be going through, um, but with this specific focus on a, a more intelligent and a scientific approach to measuring uh, security culture and how that all underpins. Um, if you have any questions as we go through, um, we'll leave some time at the end. There's a Q&A function uh, within the, uh, the Zoom webinar, um, so you should see that at the bottom of the screen. Uh, and what you'll be able to do is basically field those questions, and between Chris and I, if you have questions about Viadex uh, and or CybeSafe, uh, we'll be more than happy to answer those uh, at the end of the session. So um, I suppose it's worth highlighting that the challenges around security awareness are, are um, quite extensive. Um, essentially, the, the methodology that attackers and, and uh, threat actors are adopting uh, is to actually have changed their approach completely from those more traditional hacking related and infrastructure based attacks uh, to focus more on, on targeting people within an organization through things like social engineering. And of course, the classic example of that is phishing over email. But of course, the problem's much wider than that. But critically, alongside that growth and that spike, um, this is from the Verizon data, uh, data breach investigations report um, from last year, 
alongside that particular spike in, uh, in, in a change of, att uh, um, of attack types, all the other traditional vectors are actually in decline. They're not even staying static. So people are really, uh, threat actors are really starting to change their approach when it comes to trying to compromise your users. And now, this is probably something that you're all mostly familiar with, and it's widely reported. Anything between 80% um, uh, and 95% of all successful cyber attacks involve some form of human error. So it makes sense that attackers are adopting that as the mechanism of trying to cause you and your organization harm. But alongside that, and as we've already highlighted, this, this traditional approach to security awareness doesn't really impact behavior in any way. Um, take an example outside of security. We all know that we should be saving as much as we physically can for our pension, for our retirement, for making sure that we have uh, you know, income to support us when we no longer receive a salary. Now, with that being said, we still spend money on things that don't contribute to that. Um, so I suppose the point is, is that even though awareness that that is the best possible thing to do, that doesn't necessarily guarantee action unless it's a repeat behavior and unless it's one that's influenced in the right way. So that's just an example of where we say awareness doesn't impact behavior is that just because you know something is a risk doesn't mean you're necessarily going to be able to um, behave in a way that avoids or, or works around that risk. Coupled with that is that there's really a lack of any data or metrics to uh, help security professionals or IT leaders um, to measure the effectiveness of what's being done or indeed the impact on cyber resilience as a result of the activities you undertake as part of a security awareness program. Now, of course, in every other aspect of security, you have um, an ability to measure the impact and the effectiveness of what you're deploying. When it comes to training and even phishing simulations, you're very, very limited and restricted on what you can measure and what that really tells you about what you can do to, to improve matters. And of course, as a group of professionals, um, uh, people uh, don't really, as, uh, sorry, as administrators, people don't really have any access to advice uh, or guidance or help or ideas, but also end users don't really have that help or guidance. They have a security team, they might have policies and procedures to refer back to, but at that point of need, they're definitely not going to go and revisit their security awareness training to find the advice and the guidance they need about how to respond to a security threat. And of course, all of that combines into an environment where um, cyber risk remains uh, relatively high. Uh, awareness uh, effectiveness and, and the impact of that remains fairly ambiguous and fuzzy. It costs a lot more money and takes a lot more time than it should do. Um, and doesn't really give you any more visibility of where you're carrying risk or what you can do to reduce it. That then has a knock-on effect of any value recognition from senior leaders within an organization. will say, well, why are we bothering if it's not having an effect? And then, of course, uh, you as professionals are struggling to get any new ideas or struggle to measure that impact alongside probably preferentially uh, omitting that, set, that uh, aspect of reporting from your cyber risk uh, measurements. And so the problem that CybeSafe looks to solve um, is that ambiguity and that lack of discernible impact when it comes to that, that human aspect of cybersecurity, particularly as it relates um, to awareness, behavior, and culture. But of course, conventional wisdom, and uh, you know, these two excerpts from uh, some uh, regulatory bodies and indeed some accreditation bodies for the likes of ISO 27001, uh, it only ever seems to reference security awareness as the process of training and educating employees about computer security. It doesn't make any reference whatsoever uh, about how they apply that newly acquired knowledge and how they respond to certain security situations. So with that definition only talking about educating people, it assumes that increasing people's security awareness automatically changes their behavior. But of course, what we observe and what we've all experienced is that that's not really the case. So consider passwords. Most people, today, users and administrators alike, um, will know what constitutes a secure password. However, as recently as last year, the most popular password in use was still something along the lines of 123456 or password 11 or QWERTY UIOP. Uh, those sorts of things are basically an, an indicator that people in most cases will default to what they find most convenient and what they find is uh, the, the, the sort of the smallest obstacle to them remaining productive um, and actually sacrificing security as a result. So that obviously presents a problem that from an academic perspective, from a behavioral science and from general psychology, is that we assume that users are interested in cybersecurity and we assume that they want to learn. Dangerous assumption number one. Um, we've also tried to alter what we consider as security practitioners to be wrong behavior, rather than actually trying to fundamentally understand the root cause of that behavior and why people do what they do in the first place. 
Uh, and perhaps the most dangerous assumption of all is that we tend to assume and treat users as just another endpoint or an extension of the endpoint. And of course, the reality of that is far, far removed from the case. Um, you have people who, depending on how much sleep they got the night before, how caffeinated they are, or how much stress they happen to be under in their role, will basically make different decisions based on any conceivable combination of those factors. And so essentially, you need to begin by understanding that awareness, whilst it's necessary as part of this influencing and, and, and this uh, behavioral approach um, of driving this people-centric approach, is that there's an awful lot that's missed between that bridge of awareness and behavior. And most of it is around the context of people's mental capacity, people's social standing, the community they find themselves in in, in the workplace. Um, but also their physical and situational environment as well. Um, so what are the accepted norms? What are uh, the, the commonly used practices? What are the unwritten rules that exist within an organization? Is someone going to be penalized for slowing down their rate of work in order to uh, ensure the authenticity of an email before clicking on a link, for example? All of these things are not really measured in any way when you're taking people through training. And so this approach to the ABC side of things is basically taking this view that if you could understand what a person knows, what a person does, and the person's environment, you get a much clearer picture of where you're carrying risk and what you can do to reduce it. Now, if you're running just uh, sort of training modules and phishing simulations, it's incredibly difficult to identify anything beyond the very superficial about any of those factors. And so that's why the focus on people is so much more important. If you focus on the way people behave, understand why that behavior exists in the first place, what they think and feel, their perceptions, their sentiments and their attitudes to the topic of cybersecurity and its importance, and, and also the things that prevent them from behaving as securely as they should, you're in a far better position to actually maximize the effectiveness of the security team's activities when it comes to the people aspect. And so that focus on people and those root causes of behavior is something that essentially we're able to help with very straight, uh, very simply in, in a straightforward manner. Now the need for behavioral science is obvious in this sort of uh, situation because awareness on its own fails to trigger those security behaviors. You can even remind people quite regularly of, you should do this, you should do that, you should do this. But if it's a one way street, it kind of becomes a bit of a broken record. And if people don't have that existing um, uh, kind of appreciation of the importance of cybersecurity, uh, then those reminders and those nudges aren't really going to help. So that whole approach, the whole approach we take from psychology and behavioral science implementation into how our platform is de uh, uh, defined can tell us what works and why in changing behavior for each individual and then begins to tailor that experience to individuals in, over time. And that helps them make it easier or makes it easier for them to translate that awareness into action in a way that suits them and in a way that you can measure. And just going to that point about the rationality piece, um, this is not going to become a, a psychology lecture or a behavioral science lecture by any stretch of the imagination. But for those of you who may not be uh, sort of familiar with it, there are essentially two types of thinking in humans. And bear in mind, we're a species who have evolved over millions and millions of years. Um, around 95% of our decision making capacity relies on what we describe as intuition and instinct. So they're fast decisions, they're unconscious decisions, they rely, they're relied upon for everyday decisions. Um, and indeed, uh, as a result, because they are reflexive in many ways, uh, they tend to be more error prone than the alternative system of thinking, which represents about 5%, which is the more rational thinking. So we would all like to describe ourselves as rational. However, it is preordained in our genetics and from our species evolution that in order to survive, and the reason we've, able, we've, we've been able to evolve to the point that we have done is that we reserve a majority of our brain power for making uh, those rational decisions and therefore restrict the use of brain power for making those quick and easy decisions. So those more slow and conscious and complex decisions where we take time to consider the consequences and basically choose what we do from there is related to system two. Now there's absolutely no prize in guessing where a majority of cybersecurity behaviors are fixed in those systems of thinking. And it is of course system number one. Now what that means is that you're of course error prone. In the same way that you're error prone in deciding to uh, you know, run, for, run for your train on a, on a platform where it leaves most of the time, uh, and then only to find out it's completely the opposite end of, the, uh, end of the, the station and you end up missing the train. 
That's the sort of system one thinking. Instead of actually stopping to check, identify, and make the decision, that takes more time, but ultimately could have mean, mean, uh, meant that you, uh, you would catch that train. Bit of a bad example, but you see what I mean. And so what that means is that we make those decisions within system one based on uh, what we call psychological biases. And biases are there to um, allow us to, to carry out repeat behaviors without expending any brain capacity. So there are almost 300 psychological biases that can be influenced when it comes to those repeat behaviors. Um, and just as a couple of examples, think about um, positions of authority. Um, so when we talk about the authority bias, from a very early age, you're taught to obey what your parents tell you. Uh, then you go to school, you're taught to obey your teachers and so on into the public domain and adult life where you're told to obey, obey police officers, then in the workplace, your boss, and then eventually when you retire, you'll end up obeying your spouse more often than not. Um, but that's just an example of what we're talking about, the authority bias, is that we grow up, we spend our entire lives responding to authority in quite a um, uh, uh, sort of quite an underhand way in terms of if we receive something that appears to be from a position of authority, we're more likely to treat it with the, with the weight and with the credence that it deserves because of that person's authority over us. And, and a similar example is, you know, how easily can you imagine death by shark attack um, compared to a death by vending machine? Uh, the latter is statistically more likely. More people die every year in vending machine related incidents than people who are killed by shark attacks. And so, it kind of, even though statistically that is the evidence and that is the fact, we will all imagine that shark attack uh, or shark attack deaths are going to be more prevalent because there's so much available um, kind of imagery that you've got things like Jaws, you have various uh, films about sharks, you see sensationalized news media outlets, even when it doesn't happen in our country, if it goes all the way across the world, this person, this surfer managed to avoid a shark attack. So it's when we talk about the availability bias, that's what we're talking about. So how easily do these images come to mind? And just those two examples is a massive, massive indicator of how we rely on those things. Even though we know that, that, that they're there, it still doesn't mean we can ignore them. Um, but that's just two examples of how cyber criminals can socially engineer people. Think about business email compromise and CEO fraud. Someone pretends to be a financial director or a CEO or a senior leader within an organization. You're more likely to get, the, get a response from someone more junior within that organization. And so that's the sort of individual that you target. Um, the same with the availability bias. If it seems like something that is fairly common in how your organization operates, um, then of course you're going to assume that it's normal behavior and it's nothing out of the ordinary. So whilst these can... and uh, I'll, I'll come on to explain what I mean by that. Alongside the whole behavioral element, of course, is, is the fact that our environment uh, affects our security. So outside factors which make behavior possible. Um, so what we mean by that is that, consider the photo of the physical environment here on the left-hand side. As nice as that would be in design for a green space within an urban area, if people are trying to get from A to B and their objective is obstructed by the fact that they're being asked to walk further around than if they were to cut that corner, then you will very quickly see a, a new path blazed over that green space, which of course is, was never its intent. But of course, if you design around what people are actually trying to do, then the success of encouraging people to follow that route is far, far more likely. And quite often, a lot of policies and procedures are written by security professionals who haven't actually consulted in any way or understood the objectives and the productivity of various individuals in their organization. So they're done in isolation of everything else that you would expect to take into account. But there's also a social element as well. Security, much like everything else um, for, for, the, for the species of, uh, of, of humans that we are, um, is quite a social being. So if you are going to appear to be the odd one out for being very security conscious and making sure that you are, uh, you know, treating everything with, um, uh, you know, checking the authenticity of every message that comes into your mailbox and therefore uh, kind of slowing down your, your, your work rate, then of course you're going to be less inclined to do that because if that makes you the odd one out, then it makes you uh, sort of stand out more and it obviously it highlights it's proverbially, proverbially sticking your head above the parapet. So there's two components there that most organizations tend to overlook and I suppose to consider culture in another way is that quite often um, organizations will tell, uh, will tell either investors and external individuals and even people internally saying this is how we say we get things done. 
So we're looking at shared values, strategy, uh, goals, policies and procedures, all of that kind of thing. But the reality of what really shapes culture is the, the lower half of the proverbial iceberg. So it's the unwritten rules. It's the stories about th this time someone did something like this. It's how people feel. Uh, it's about the tradition and the shared assumptions and all of these sorts of things. And that's actually really where security culture starts to take off and starts to underpin good behaviors. Because if you design a security environment around all of those components, rather than just what you can see above the surface, then you're putting yourself in a far better position when it comes to um, uh, uh, creating that culture that optimizes for good security behavior. So when we talk about a people-centric approach to this security culture is making sure that you're designing around the way people behave and a focus on what they really think and feel about security and what you know, what encourages them to, uh, to, to behave in certain ways and what prevents them from behaving in certain other ways. Um, but that's shaped through the physical and social environment within the organization. Um, and I'm sure many of you on the call will have an idea about what uh, your culture actually looks like, but without actually being able to quantify it in any way so that you can turn around to the rest of your teams and say, this is what we need to do in order to facilitate an improvement to our security culture. And just as an example of, of the sort of things that we measure and track as part of our approach to measuring this is you look at things like trust. So if employees are to follow processes, then they need to have faith in those processes, why they're there, um, and as well as the individuals who actually put them in place. Um, so if you're feeling uneasy or mistrustful towards either of those things or the choices of an organization in putting them in place, then it's unlikely that desirable behaviors associated with it are going to be maintained. Research has actually tended to show that by focusing on incentivizing those trustworthy behaviors rather than restricting and controlling their actions, that trust is improved. And by contrast, that excessive monitoring will likely reduce it quite significantly. Improving communication lines is, is fundamental in building a strong security culture, but it, it's also critically important to ensure that communications are contextualized to the role, um, to the industry, to the level of experience of the recipients, um, so that they're aware of what the actual threats are that could be posed to an individual in their position. So instead of approaching it from a security 101 for all people best fit and let's just hope for the best um, instead you should look to tailor that that engagement and tailor those communications to each individual it, it's actually been suggested along these lines that stress in the workplace tends to arise from um, an imbalance between the demands of a person's role and the resources that are available to help them do that role so when it comes to security consider that if employees are asked to follow policies without receiving the sufficient or necessary support to do so, they will become stressed by trying to follow those policies. And so, again, as the, as the human beings that we are, we're programmed to try and uh, avoid stress and they'll therefore subvert the policy as a result. So you can start to see how these different cultural components are actually feeding into user behavior. Um, do, uh, does an individual consider security their own individual responsibility or do they think it's a responsibility of another department uh, or a group of people within their organization? Um, so consider that for a security team. If they are to prevent cyber threats, uh, there needs to be a collaborative effort from all employees. There's no way that a security team in isolation can carry that out. Um, and research has shown um, that most at-risk employees will often delegate security to another source. So those who don't consider it to their uh, to be their responsibility. Uh, that other source could be something technological. So as Chris pointed out, the assumption that, uh, you know, the antivirus or the email filter will block all the nasties from hitting my mailbox. And therefore, everything that arrives in that environment uh, will be safe. And therefore, I should interact with it without thinking. Uh, or it could be another person or a department within the organization, like the IT, the IT department deal with security. That's their job. Um, when in fact, it's been shown that those employees that often delegate those responsibility um, will tend to uh, do so with a sense of resignation, as in like a feeling that they will never really understand it or that it will never be their responsibility as a result of their lack of understanding. With that resignation comes low confidence, and with low confidence, um, it's basically going to hinder their chances of changing behavior. So again, it's about understanding where responsibilities and what people's perception of responsibility lies. Productive security. So it's been shown that when security policies are designed to enable productivity, um, as well as whatever it is that they're mandating uh, as part of that policy, that people are more likely to comply with them. Um, so uh, security policies developed, as I mentioned, usually in isolation from the people who are expected to follow them. 
uh, usually without a full understanding of how people work and what it is that motivates them in their roles. Um, and therefore, uh, if it's at odds with that, then it's likely to result in non-compliance with the policy. So as I mentioned, humans have uh, limited cognitive ability. If we spent 100% of our time in system two thinking and making rational decisions, um, we'd probably last about an hour a day. Um, so if security requirements are too uh, much of a heavy burden, it can force employees to slow down or stop work entirely. Um, community, as I mentioned, the social element. Um, so it's really important in building people-centric security culture because those social norms represent uh, acceptable group conduct around things like security. So they guide behavior in, in organizations of all sizes. Um, and they basically act as fast and unwritten rules around what to do to protect data and information systems. So there is a wealth of research that's shown that a primary driver of user behavior is whether or not that person believes other important people in their lives approve of it. So these important people in the workplace may be their immediate colleagues or line managers or even senior leaders, um, but also personal contacts such as family and friends. So if an employee within an organization feels like others will disapprove if they spend time to actively comply with security policies like reporting breaches, uh, slowing down work for security and so on, then they simply won't do it. Um, but of course, that then has a knock-on effect is that if they see other employees or colleagues or line management who they respect not behaving securely, they're also more likely to mirror that behavior. So when it comes to culture, management behavior shapes the behavior of the employees. And when there's a perceptual gap between leaders and staff, until that's closed, um, basically no, no, it's not, they're not gonna be pursuing that same common goal, which is keeping the organization secure. You know, related to someone's behavioral control, um, whether or not people feel at ease or at odds with performing particular security behaviors. And um, again, research suggests that if someone feels at ease when performing a task, then they will likely continue doing it. And if they struggle, they will likely stop. Um, so within security, obviously an example of that would be employees practicing security related behavior regularly, like reporting breaches, uh, looking for signs of phishing, um, and of course, things that, that you know, basically help them feel more familiar with processes and make them feel more easy. Um, and suppose the secure choice should be the easiest choice when it comes to cybersecurity. And in many cases and in many organizations, that's simply not the case. And very finally, um, this, this idea of justness and fairness uh, is basically an employee's view of how their organization treats them in regards to cybersecurity or whether or not they feel fairly treated or unjustly punished and monitored when it comes to interacting with technology. Um, so as an example, a, a, a just and fair security culture will see your employees speak up more often and more confidently if things go wrong. And that's really important when considering that the dwell time for a lot of security incidents is so long because those who feel like they may have uh, inadvertently caused an issue um, are simply gonna feel like they're gonna be punished if they make, uh, make their business aware of it. So getting rid of this idea that blame is a useful concept in organizations when it comes to security is a really important first step. And too often, um, people are blamed for their, their inability to follow security advice and policies. Um, so in order to create basically those security pillars, rather than the traditionally described weak links, um, people really need to be engaged in security. And that requires investing in a workplace environment that uh, you know, it encourages positive security acts rather than rather than an environment that blames and bullies and, and punishes people for what is essentially, as we've already covered, being human, making mistakes and making error prone judgments. So um, I suppose the, the critical question is that how many of these cultural dimensions, if any at all, can you realistically measure through delivering security awareness training uh, and or uh, phishing simulations? Um, the, the answer, of course, is, is very, very little and very, very few uh, indeed. So just as sort of a, a, a pleasant segue to that is that these are the dimensions that we measure as part of our cultural assessment tool, um, or CCAT as we call it, um, which is basically a mechanism that allows us to uh, measure and help you develop that people-centric approach to cybersecurity culture um, through this diagnostic survey uh, and indeed a data analysis engine. What we then apply at the back end is a, is a, a, a sense of powerful analytics um, and uh, those behavioral science principles that I mentioned to essentially reveal very simple and very straightforward insights that help direct your activity as a security team 
uh, about how you shape your culture and, uh, and it identifies the elements of your company, not just as a global culture, but groups of users, departments, regions, all of that kind of thing. So you can actually begin to identify how you should support different groups in a more constructive way to help foster that people-centric approach to security. And in doing so, that obviously provides leaders with recommendations um, on how to develop and foster that, um, that security behavior. And of course, um, uh, sorry, in that security culture, but the idea of um, uh, those recommendations is that, uh, and the, the approaches that we've taken with this, is we've had it ratified by our own in-house behavioral science team whose expertise is exclusively in psychology and influencing behavior rather than as security professionals. And then we've applied the security, po the, the security approach on top of it. Um, so that, that means that we can successfully uh, improve and measure improvements to predict security behavior in the future based on the results from this cultural assessment. And it's really a centerpiece around uh, this idea of uh, a behavior change model which relies upon identifying and directing uh, people's, uh, and encouraging, I should say, people's uh, capability, uh, their motivation for good behaviors, uh, and indeed uh, helping you to identify the opportunities uh, and create the opportunity for people to practice those good security behaviors. More often than not, uh, a lot of organizations will focus just on people's capability and hope that they will kind of fit the rest around whatever it is that they're doing. Um, and of course, what CyberSafe does as a result of that is provide this intelligent approach uh, with an online platform that helps you move away from just training and educating people to supporting and assisting people in that behavior change activity. So there's plenty of features which I won't go into today, uh, but essentially uh, enabling users to, to kind of get a better understanding about the opportunities they have to embed good security behaviors, providing tools through which they can create that environment where they are reminded at a time that suits them and in a way that suits them. But critically, is personalizing the experience to each and every user. So we apply uh, machine learning, natural language processing, and a few other clever bits of um, AI technology uh, at the back end to basically uh, help uh, tailor the experience to each specific individual so that it's more likely to land with them and encourage them to embed the right security behaviors. Um, and that includes things like a companion app uh, for, for mobile devices. Uh, and the ability to um, uh, share content with friends and family and so on. Now, all of that user engagement feeds into this administrative experience. And really what sets CyberSafe apart from every other provider on the market that focuses on the human aspect of security is the depth, and ins uh, depth of insight uh, around our data and metrics. Um, and what that means is that because of that machine learning component and how we apply those different aspects to personalize, it means we're capturing about 10,000 uh, non-sensitive data points per user over a 12-month period. And all of that is feeding into a metrics and reporting suite uh, that allows you to better understand where you're carrying risk, get, get insights on what you can do to reduce it, but also allows you to tap into uh, community insights about the rest of the CyberSafe community, other security practitioners, who basically can share their insights about what's worked, what's ha what hasn't, uh, and the ways in which they've experienced success um, in, in, in successfully influencing behavior. And of course, applying that uh, with a, a bunch of really handy critical integrations alongside uh, your existing business solutions so that you can start to bring data into CybeSafe and vice versa, um, and start to measure and report on the impact of everything you're doing around the human aspect of cybersecurity. Um, and so that's pretty much uh, everything I wanted to uh, to cover today. Hopefully it hasn't been too overwhelming in terms of some of the the, the theory and the, the science behind behavioral, uh, behavioral approaches and, and security culture. Um, and also I really, really hope it's been useful for you. Um, obviously working with Videx uh, is, is something where you can quite quickly and easily uh, organize um, uh, something if you wanted to follow up and understand more about CybeSafe and how it can be Deploy within your organization, um, including things like uh, like trials of the of the platform as well. Um, please do uh, liaise with the team over at Videx if that's of interest, um, and uh, and we will be more than happy to to get things configured for you. Um, but in the meantime, uh, I will hand back over to Chris um, just for a few closing remarks. Brilliant, thanks, Sam. Um, yes, yeah, so uh, just repeating what Sam said, I really hope that that has been uh, interesting for you all. Uh, I would love to pursue the, the topic uh, with anyone who would like to have a discussion. Please feel free to message me 
on chris.walsh at viadex.com. Um, and if you'd like us to help you through the uh, cultural assessment that Sam described, uh, or to, to get in touch with Sam, um, just drop me an email and we can follow up. Otherwise, thank you very much, Sam, and um, thank you everyone for your attention. No problem. We do have a, a couple of questions, Chris, which I will just respond okay. to now. Um, so we've got one uh, coming in saying, do we have an, any other training material like anti-money laundering, etc.? Um, very good question. One we get quite regularly. The short answer is no. Um, we're not a learning management system. Uh, we are focused on security and data protection uh, and, of course, influencing behavior around those sorts of things. So uh, there's really... Um, uh, kind of there's, there's no limit to the the content that we will work with you to develop in those topic areas um, but what we are not is a a, a compliance based uh, sort of LMS training material um, kind of platform so I hope that answers your question um, and that actually looks like the only one um, so if there are any more questions please do feel free to send them over to Chris uh, and I'm sure they'll make their way back to me if he can't answer them um, but yeah Please do uh, keep us informed and, and uh, yeah, um, thank you very much for joining us. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, Sam.